Hey, and welcome. I have another study today uh, entitled, What in the World? A study of some of the maybe perplexing parables of Jesus. We're going to look at Matthew 13 today and in what we refer to as the parable of the tares among the wheat and then a couple others that are ancillary to that. Um, so I hope you'll study with us today and, and you'll find that that's a useful study. Uh, let's have a prayer real quick and then we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for every blessing you give us. We're thankful for this time that we can study your word in peace. We are thankful to you that you have kept us safe and healthy. And we are thankful to you that you have given us so many blessings. We ask that as we are studying, that we would write your word on our hearts and that you would help us to live lives of service and that you would help us to be like Jesus in everything we do. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to look in Matthew 13, starting in verse 24, and it is a, um, there's actually three little parables there together that Jesus teaches, and you'll remember that we studied uh, early on the um, parable of the seeds and the sower, and this is right after that, and so we've gone out and looked at some other things, and now we're back here, and we're going to look in verse 24, and so this uh could be considered to be a continuation of that thought. You remember with the seeds, it was about um, the hearts and about the, the seed of the gospel being planted and people's acceptance of that. And um, he was asked at that time, why do you speak in parables? And he said, uh, because to you it is known the mystery of the kingdom, but to them it is not. And, and there, were, there were reasons that he had for, for doing that, for, for teaching in these parables so that honest, good-hearted people would understand it, but opponents would not be able to attack. And so we look in verse 24, and it is after that conversation where he has explained to them the parable of the, the seeds and the sower. And so let's just start there by reading in verse 24, and then we'll look at this um, today. In verse 24, it says, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the weed, wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? And he said, No. For while you were gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. We'll stop there for a minute. And I will say that when you read this, um, at first blush, you might have some knee-jerk reactions to it that may or may not be accurate. Uh, but it is um, a parable that is making, as we said before, a very simple point. But you have to think about it in order to get there. And that's the point of a parable. Is you have to give it some thought to really understand what he's talking about here. In the context of the seeds that are being planted that he talked about before and the hearts, this now talks about uh, a farmer that has planted good seed. And so that's the first thing we see here is that, the, uh, that he's planted good seed, but when they grow up, tares also grow, or we might say weeds, but these are really invasive, dangerous, nasty weeds that have grown up with it. And it's even questioned here. Um, did you not sow good seed? Is the seed not good? And he says, an enemy did this. Uh, somebody came in here and did this to us. They sabotaged um, our good seed and the wheat that we're growing. And then there's something that's counterintuitive here where they say, well, let's go get them. Let's go out there and, and pull up all these bad tares and just get rid of them right now, which I think would be a logical thing that any of us might say. Let's go clean up. And that's the way I am. If I see weeds, I want to go pull them up. Now, I don't do a real good job of it, but I, and I see weeds, I want to get rid of them immediately. But in this case, he says, no, I'll allow them both to grow until the harvest time and then we'll tell the people that are reaping to go out there and say, first, get up all the tares and burn them up, get rid of them, and gather the wheat into my barn. And so there, there are some obvious implications here to us um, in the 21st century. But I want to start with um, 
going back to the beginning here and talking a little bit about the basis upon which he says uh, he preaches this parable. He uses a phrase that he uses multiple times, which is important, where he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, or in other places, the kingdom of heaven is like. And so that's the first thing we have to make sure we understand clearly what he is comparing to. Later on, you'll, in a few minutes we're going to go, and this is another good one where Jesus explains. They go to him and say, what does it mean? And Jesus explains this to them, so we don't have to guess with some of the interpretation. But um, I want to start with this idea of the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, because it requires us to have a basis of understanding what the kingdom is. Because when he says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to this, he is saying this kingdom that you're wondering about, this kingdom that I am uh, taking part with, that, I'm, um, that I am introducing, is like this other thing. And so he's really just trying to help them understand it. So when we talk about the kingdom, I want to look at a few verses, and we're going to go through these really fast, but I want to look at a few verses that to me really help me understand what the kingdom is. Um, and for us today, I think we need to have that basis. And so let's just look at a few verses and talk about them for a minute. Let's start with a couple of verses in the Psalms and then um, one in Colossians. And in Psalm 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. In Psalm 103, in verse 19, The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And I'm going to look at those just for a second. Now, sometimes we have confusion against terminology where we know the world when we talk about worldliness in the world, that that is Satan's domain, worldliness and uh, the evil world. But in the case of Psalm 24 and Psalm 103, this is talking about the universe, the everything that there is in the universe. And in Psalm 24 and 1, it says it's God's. And even though we might say that the world is ruled by Satan, it's God's. The Lord owns it. And it says, everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 103, he established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And so this is one basis we want to take here, which is when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about the dominion of the king. God who rules over everything. That is the kingdom. And that he has a plan for his people. Now in Colossians 1 and verse 16, we'll look there um, quickly. Colossians 1 and verse 16 and 17, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This idea that God rules over everything. I mentioned in when our first class that I do not like to make the kingdom and the church synonymous terms. I do not believe they are. I know that there are people who can can uh, say that, and I'm not trying to disagree or say that they're just wrong. I do not talk about them as synonymous terms because they are different types of words. As I said, it's like saying America and Americans are the same thing. That's not the same. In the case of that, America is a, do a dominion. There's not a king, but it is um, everything in, in a dominion. The Americans are the people who live there. It's almost like that with the kingdom and the church. The kingdom is God's dominion, the king's dominion, and the church is all the people that are his servants, that are his family in that um, dominion. And, and that's not a perfect explanation, but I hope that that helps because I really think it's important. We talked about the spreading of the kingdom in these places. I believe it is talking about God's plan for all the world and the king and his dominion spreading to everyone and being available to everyone in the world. The church then is those people who follow him and have come to Christ and are now um, members of that. Let's look at a couple other verses. Uh, Genesis 12, verses 2 through 3. This is the promises that are made. And when these promises are made, it talks about the kingdom a little bit. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in all the families of the earth... 
will in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. In verse in chapter 26 in verse 4, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And this doesn't speak specifically about the kingdom, but it is about God's plan that the world will be blessed. And uh, through Abraham's seed, everyone in the world will be blessed. Not just um, not just the the nation of Israel, not just the Jews, but that everyone in this gospel will be for everyone. A couple other verses, Matthew 3 and verse 2. Um, he, he says, repent. This is John the Baptist, and he's going out and paving the way. And it says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, that now God's um, ultimate plan for the world is coming. John 1 and verse 29, it, and, and I think this is so poignant that he's preaching that the kingdom of heaven is near, and then when Jesus comes, it's a special moment in this kingdom. It says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Sometimes we see it says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is God's plan for the kingdom. John the Baptist was preparing for it. He said to everyone, repent, and he was baptizing, saying, prepare because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he sees Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 18, in verse 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting, would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. He says it again uh, in um, Luke 17, in verse 20. Uh, asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or, or there, for the behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So the idea here that God's kingdom is his dominion, and he is the king of the universe, and he has a plan so that all his people can be saved. And so this is, I know this is really fast, a really fast way to go through it, and I know that it is not a perfect explanation. I'm not capable of that. But it is so important that we understand that what is talk, being talked about here, the comparison is to the kingdom of heaven, and, it's, and it is God's dominion and his plan uh, for the salvation of men. So let's go back to the parable that Jesus taught here. And let's uh, just revisit it, that he says that this kingdom of God, he's trying to explain to them through parables, can be compared to this man, this good, uh, this good farmer who sowed good seed, but then when they started to come up, tears came up, uh, damaging tears came up along with the wheat. And when asked, he said, an enemy did this. And when asked again, should we go pull them all up right now? Let's just go get rid of them all right now. He said, no, let them grow up together. And then when the reaping day, when the harvest is coming, we'll pull up the tares, throw them away and destroy them. And we'll take the good wheat and put it in my barn. We'll put it in the, the place that it's supposed to be. He's gonna get rid of the tares, burn them up forever, and he's going to then take the good wheat and take it and put it where it needs to go. This was a good farmer. The farmer knew what he was doing, and now this comparison that he makes is so important to understanding the kingdom. Now, I feel like it might be helpful to us to understand kind of what was going on here, to take a quick field trip. And so um, I uh, would like to show you a field trip that I took uh, on Saturday morning and uh, that I think may just help us understand a little bit better the idea of what was going on here and the evil thing that was done to this uh, person's um, field, this good farmer's field. So let's take a quick field trip and I'll show you that and then we'll come back and talk some more. Okay, so we're going out today to show a little bit about what might have been happening when tares were planted among wheat. You can see I'm driving here past the church building. And let's take a U-turn here, and we're going to go to what I call Old McDonald's Farm. And um, this, I think, is a good example of a farmer who is a good farmer who plants good seed. And in this scenario, I will be playing the part of the evil one. Um, it's kind of a nasty morning this morning, which may be a good um, environment for the dastardly deeds that we're going to do here. So let's see how secure this gate is. Ah, so we get in no problem. So we're going to go back around here and 
show you a field. We'll call call this just a, a farmer's field, and uh, we'll just uh, see what we can do to try to make this point a little more clear. So here we are at Jim Harbaugh's garden and uh, seeing his wildlife here. And we're going to come in here and uh, now Jim Harbaugh is a good farmer. He knows what he's doing. He, some have said he's almost as good a gardener as I am, um, but most people say he's not quite as good. But you can see pretty impressive garden here. He's got lots of stuff growing. I don't even know what the half this stuff is, but he's got lots of produce. and. We are going to come here, and what I'm going to do is I've got here with me some Silver Queen corn. And uh, let me show you this here. This is Silver Queen corn. It grows to about eight foot tall. Uh, and we're going to plant that here. Just gonna, we're just going to sow it here, right here in the midst of his garden. And you put one there. We'll put a couple more. It seems like there's a good spot over here. So this is, um, this will be something I just, I'm sure he would love to have some nice fresh corn and uh, grows good in Florida but we're gonna put that right in there so here we go so we're gonna find out what happens here and obviously um, this is not something he planted but probably not exactly what he wants so we'll get out of here before anybody notices we're milling around in their backyard So we'll just um, head back home now uh, and get back to our study. Okay, so I hope that was helpful to you. I think you can see um, that that's a thing that can be damaging. We're going to find out here in a few weeks. Um, what happens, and we'll see how the good farmer deals with that situation. So um, hopefully that just helped you visualize a little bit of what happened in the middle of the night in this scenario. So we're going to have to take an aside here because Jesus tells a couple other parables, a couple other brief parables, before he explains to his disciples what he was talking about. And obviously some of this, we already see some clarity in it because of, uh, you know, we already know the Bible. But I want to look at these other two because it's important to see why he then takes an aside here to talk about these other two parables before he goes back, and goes back and explains it. So let's look in verse 31 and we'll see a little bit further what he teaches. In verse 31 of Matthew 13, he says, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it's full grown, it is larger in the garden plants uh, than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. We'll stop there. This is, a, uh, I think, one we have to be very careful with because if we have a knee-jerk reaction to this, um, and I don't know exactly, but we could misinterpret what Jesus' point is here. We have to see it in the context of what he's speaking about. Remember, he did the parable of the seeds and talked about the gospel being, being sown and the hearts that it's sown in and the acceptance of it. Then he uh, comes now and talks about this, uh, these tares and the wheat. But he speaks about the mustard seed and some, some things we should know about this. First of all, he does talk about the mustard seed being the tiniest little seed. But the fact is that a mustard plant is not a tree. It does not grow a big mustard tree. It's usually a bush. And so I have seen, honestly, I have seen scholarly interpretations of this on two different sides of its interpretation. Many, even I think um, scholarly people have said, well, this is talking about how the gospel is preached and it's gonna just grow to this huge kingdom and it's gonna be so huge that birds will be able to be uh, nest in it and uh, it will be something that gives um, benefit to everyone because of this, this great growth of the kingdom. And I'm not, I am not wise enough to tell you whether that is exactly right or not. I will say we need to be careful 
and I hope you'll study this yourself because the fact that this mustard seed grows into a tree is abnormal. It is growing into something that really is not a mustard plant. It is something huge. And, and when it talks about here, it, it, the quote that it makes, that Jesus makes here, that when it says it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Um, remember, the just before this, remember who the birds were in the parable of the seeds and the sower? The birds were Satan. And I don't know if he's using these in two different contexts or not, but we should be careful because I remember I said, really today, Satan would be compared to squirrels. They are the nastiest creatures. But in the case of the parable of the seeds, birds were Satan. And in here he says, the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This is a quote from Ezekiel. And it is about the fall of Egypt. It is about um, the, this growth, this giant um, abnormal growth and the fall of Egypt. And so I do not have a deep enough scholarly learning to tell you exactly how to interpret that, but I do know that we should look at it from two different perspectives. One, yes, the kingdom is going to grow. The kingdom is going to be a great thing that is benefits everyone, just like we saw the promises to Abraham. But in the case of this, a mustard seed growing into something that's abnormally large, and when it says birds of the air nest in its branches, quoting Ezekiel and, in, and about Egypt, it could be said that this is saying that it will be corrupted. Just like what we see about tares growing among wheat, it could be that the kingdom is going to grow, but then there will be some things that grow with it, that grow out and become something that um, is negative, something that is um, grown and is damaging uh, from Satan. So I hope you'll think about that. I hope you'll look at it yourself. I tend to think that this is another parable about corruption. Another, ter another parable about uh, sin and corruption that is coming in and trying to undermine uh, the kingdom. But it does say the kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed. And, and I think it could be said that the mustard seed, when, when growing uh, correctly, makes a good thing. But if it does not grow properly, it can be turned into something that's evil. So think about that. I hope you'll study that yourself and think further. Verse 33, let's go on and look. Verse 33, it says, He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. And then he goes on, All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Let's look at that just for a moment. This is a little short one. This is the short, you know, the shortest parable you can have. It's one sentence. But it says, um, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. And we know leaven is, uh, you know, is put into a bread to help it rise. And it says that woman took uh, and hid it in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. And I have heard also the exact same thing, two almost opposite interpretations of this by scholarly people. One says that this leaven is like the gospel, which is going to spread just like it does in when you put leaven in, in uh, dough. It's going to spread and it's going to cause the gospel to make this great, huge thing that the kingdom will take over the world and the kingdom will be this great thing to the world. Um, that's a fair assessment, but we need to look at it again to be careful. To say that when we say it's like leaven, we know that leaven is um, not a positive thing in some of the New Testament interpretations. Galatians 5, this is where we talk about a little leaven leavens the whole loaf. And this is about sin and corruption. This is about a little bit of, of, of evil, you know, bad spreads. This little leaven can spread and do bad things. And so the other example of uh, leaven is about sin growing and, and spreading and trying to do damage. It's also interesting that Three pecks of flour would have been a huge amount of flour. Once again, an abnormal amount of flour to make a loaf of bread. And that it doesn't say that she put leaven in it in order to make great bread. It says that she hid the leaven in three pecks of flour. And then it was all leavened. There, there, I think it would be fair to say that a, a, an interpretation of this could be that, it, that leaven being hid in the three pecks of flour... Um, 
demonstrates that there could be evil that's lurking and that there's false teaching that then could spread out and, and damage the whole loaf. And so I, once again, I hope you'll think about that. I cannot tell you, um, I cannot tell you which way to take it. I can only suggest that in context, in the context of the tares among the wheat, that it would be fair to interpret, interpret this, that this is corruption that can grow and can, and can take over. And that that's something that God understands is going to happen. And even though he's a good farmer, even though he um, is good and good seed is planted, these, this 11 and this abnormal mustard uh, tree can take over. So I'll leave it at that. I hope you'll study that yourself and you'll think about that because I think, <clears throat> I think that um, in this context, we do need to understand that Jesus is speaking about corruption and he's speaking about things that can take over and damage. And in a minute, we'll see about what the outcome of that is. Just, to, just in passing, um, we want to talk about what he says here in verse 34. It says, All things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. I don't think this means that he never said anything that wasn't a parable. We know that's not true. But for the time being, in this circumstance, he just said everything in parables because of the crowd, because of the people that were there looking to damage him or looking to take pot shots at him. Um, but for the time being, he was speaking in parables, and it says, like in Psalm 78, this is a quote from Psalm 78, it is the fulfilling of a prophecy. Um, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Just like he said related to the seeds and the sower, that parable. Things are hidden. There are mysteries that have to be revealed. And in revealing them, he has to use these very careful stories that um, help people understand them. All right. So now let's look um, at what he says is the explanation of this. We're very fortunate that in these circumstances, he um, explains to his disciples, and we have it recorded, what this means. And so Let's move on to verse 36 and see what Jesus says. In verse 36, Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field, which I think I would ask the same thing. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire so shall it be at the end of the age the son of man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who committed lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So we're not going to take a lot of time reinterpreting Jesus' interpretation, but I just want to point out some things that he taught here and make an application. Discuss the point that he makes here. Jesus did an excellent job of just going line by line and saying, here is what we're talking about. He says that the one who sows the seed is the Son of Man. And so he's saying that Jesus and his teaching and, and his um, bringing, of God, bringing of God's plan, that God's plan for his people, it's the Son of Man who is, who is sowing the good seed. And so we know the, the sower is good and we know the seed is good, just like it said. He says the field is the world. It's important for us to notice here that he does not say that the field is the church or that the field is um, the kingdom. He says the field is the world. And it says, as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil ones. So <clears throat> once again, in this case, the, uh, the seed is not necessarily the gospel. In this case, he says the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. It is the people who are the good and righteous people in God's kingdom. But the tares, these, um, these weeds that come up, these dangerous weeds that come up, that is the sons of the evil one. That is the false teaching, uh, evil people trying to do damage to God's plan and the teaching of his gospel. And it says the enemy who sowed these seeds, and once again, the seeds um, 
the tares that come up are the um, sons of the evil one. But he says the enemy is the devil, is the Satan. I think we kind of understood that, that the seeds of these evil people teaching false doctrine that are, that are trying to undermine God's plan, those are the people and the person sowing them is Satan. And then it says the gathering up that happens and the burning of, of, of these tares with fire, it says, is going to be what it's like at the end of the age. And I think we want to look at Matthew 24 just for a second. Uh, we could do a, you know, many studies. I've done an entire quarter and could have done longer just on eschatology and the end of time. And this in Matthew 24 helps us see a picture of it. Let's just look at a couple of verses that reinforce this idea of the end of the age, the son of man, the sons of the kingdom, and those things. So let's look first of all in Matthew 24 in verse 3. Um, and it says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And so we see the context of um, this end of the age. When will it be and what will it be? And in verse 29, Jesus says, but immediately, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the signs of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. I just wanted to read that because the, some of this terminology is the same, and this, uh, some of these ideas are the same. But it says the end of the age, this harvest time, is when the angels are going to come, and Jesus will come out of the sky with his angels and all of his people are going to be gathered and taken into eternity. And it is very similar language to what he uses here, this idea of the Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them in the furnace of fire in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see this idea that at the end of time, at the harvest time, the judgment will come. And those tares are going to be getting theirs. Uh, that wasn't meant to rhyme, but that was pretty good. So they will be gathered up and they're going to be thrown into the fire. They're going to be just in destruction forever. But then it's so important, this last statement that he makes. And this is a quote from Daniel. And, this, and it is this concept of this obvious differentiation between those of Satan and those of God. And it says in verse 43, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. Let him hear. This differentiation to me is the point. That God is going to separate them at that time. And those who were evil, those who were undermining his gospel, those who were false teachers, they're going to be gathered up and they're going to be burned and, and thrown away forever. But his people are going to shine in glory. That his people it will shine forth like the sun. Triumph for those people. And so I think this stark contrast on judgment is an important factor in what he's teaching here. It is not going to happen now. It is not going to happen before them. That differentiation is not happening right now necessarily. But he is waiting, and at the judgment time, at the harvest time, that's when the differentiation will be made, and it will be a stark contrast. I, I can't help but think of Psalm 73, and we're not going to turn there, but I hope you remember Psalm 73. It says, Surely God is Israel to those who are pure in heart. And it goes on then to talk about, But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. And it says, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It is so interesting that in, this, uh, that in this Psalm 73, it's saying, I know God is good. I know he is good to his people, but it's hard for me because I see wicked people, even false teachers that are prospering. They have good lives. It says that they don't have pain. They're fat and happy. They're living really good lives. And it's hard for me because maybe as a Christian, my life isn't that easy. My life is hard. And I see evil people whose lives are very easy, but the outcome of it is, but then I came to you, God, I came, I, I, I came before you and I saw their end. 
and it said, I realize that you are going to reward me, and if I have pain, you're going to reward me, but they're going to get destruction. It says, um, whom have I in heaven but you, God? I know I trust you, and I perceived their end, and I realized you have this under control, God. Even though right now I don't see it, you, God, have this under control. I hope you'll read Psalm 73. It's a really interesting study that relates to this. But, but I just really think we should, we should close by just saying there is a simple point in this parable of the tares among the wheat. God is going to take care of it. God is going to take care of those who are evil, and he is going to cast them out, and they are going to be destroyed. God is not sanitizing this world right now. He is not coming now and plucking out all the evil people now. We don't live in a world that is perfectly clean. We live as righteous people teaching the good gospel from Jesus among people who are teaching false doctrine and among people who are evil. But the eternal reward is where only the righteous will be. And the kingdom that is eternal and the reward that we will receive, that's where God will bring his people. That's the barn that the wheat is brought into. I hope you see that, this very clear picture that God is not cleaning it out right now. God is not plucking out all of the evil people right now. But there will come a day at harvest when that separation will be very clear. And the evil will be sent away in destruction and... God's people will shine and they will receive a reward and God will bring them into his house. I hope that means something to you. To me, it's so interesting and it's so meaningful to understand that God has a plan. He has a kingdom and he is the king of it. He has a plan for his people. And even if we don't get immediate gratification, we know that he has an eternal plan for us. Thank you for your time today. I hope this was helpful to you. It was very interesting for me to study, and I hope that you see how powerful these parables are from Jesus, how simple they are, and how useful they are uh, to us now. All right, that'll be it for today. Um, I look forward to seeing you next time when we continue the study. You may have